This morning we will learn that there are essentially two ways to reject the truth of God's word and the good news about Jesus Christ. One way of rejecting these amazing things is like a dog, and the other way is like a pig. Today's passage calls us to recognize those who Jesus is referring to as spiritual dogs and spiritual pigs, and we will see exactly what Jesus is saying we should and should not do in those cases. Please turn with me this morning to Matthew 7, 6, and we will see what Jesus commanded us not to do in the case of spiritual dogs and pigs. He said, Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. As always, we must interpret Scripture with Scripture and make sure that we do not go beyond what is written here. Let's begin by asking the first simple question that comes to mind when we read this. What does Jesus mean when he said dogs and swine? Peter tells us a lot about the canine and the swine and what they have in common in 2 Peter 2, 20-22. He wrote, For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow, having washed to her wallowing in the mire. Peter paints a very yucky picture here about the dog returning to its own vomit. But as gross as that is, I actually know it's accurate because I can remember my dog growing up did this exact same gross thing. One lesson from this disgusting idea that I promise I won't talk too much about anymore is spiritual dogs are not very wise, discerning or picky about the foul things that they will eat. The passage that Peter's undoubtedly thinking of as he wrote these words was Proverbs 26.11, which says, As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. The Bible explains that the spiritual dog is a fool who repeats his foolishness. The word as tells us that the dog is a metaphor for the fool, and the vomit is a metaphor for the fool's folly or stupidity. We have all probably done something in life we can look back on and think, what was I thinking? Not a silly thing like a bad 80s hairdo, which that one's a winner, but more like a sinful rebellion against God, like drunkenness or adultery or some other foolish and deadly sinful behavior. The dog returns to these types of foolishness over and over again, and that is the vomit that Peter is referring to. Proverbs 1.7 explains, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So fools not only return to their vomit, so to speak, by returning to their foolishness, they also despise wisdom and instruction because it reveals their foolishness for the disgusting mess that it is. The spiritual dog is someone who prefers wickedness, foolishness, and darkness over God's wisdom, his instruction, and his light. And Jesus indicates that they will turn and tear you to pieces if you continue to try to feed them holy things. Have you ever seen someone who got very indignant, angry, and hostile when the truth of God's word was presented to them? Did you ever witness that person actually prefer to continue in their old sinful lifestyle, which is just like vomit in the eyes of God? rather than to develop a love for God's truth in his word. They foolishly rejected the fear of God and decided to continue in their filthy sins, 
even though God in his word plainly warned them to repent. That person, according to the Bible, and according to Jesus, is a spiritual dog. And when we are sure of that fact, not when we assume it, we are commanded to no longer give them holy things. Well, how about the cousin of the spiritual canine, the spiritual swine? What distinguishes them and makes Jesus mention them together with dogs here? It's worth noting that there are only two New Testament passages that mention dogs and pigs together, and they point in the same direction. We read the Lord's words in Matthew where the two animals are combined, and we saw Peter's words earlier where they were both mentioned. But Peter, when mentioning them both in the same sentence, said that swine, or the sow as he put it, is someone who, having washed, returns to wallow in the mire. Notice the dog did not wash. It simply returned to its vomit. But the pig did wash and later went back to the mud. We saw that a dog despised wisdom and instruction and preferred foolishness and sin. But it seems clear that the swine did not despise God's wisdom. They accepted it, but later prefer to return to wallowing in the mire of sin. The dog was not made clean, but the sow was washed only to go back to its old filthiness. From what scripture reveals, I'm convinced that spiritual dogs are those who reject God's truth outright, while spiritual swine are those who receive the truth and are washed but later go back to wallow in the mire. In other words, dogs reject truth, but swine reject actually living according to the truth and obedience, even though they claim to accept it. If someone rejects the gospel just so they can continue in their sinful lifestyle, they're like a dog, and they will turn on you and tear you to pieces if you continue to give them holy things. But a sow will seem to accept the truth and even be washed by it, only later to go back to wallowing in their mire of filthy sin. As Peter said, both turned away from the way of righteousness and the holy commandment given to them. But the dog turned away at first without truly being cleansed, and the sow turned away later. The dog turned back to its foolishness, not even disturbed by the truth, when they rejected the fear of the Lord. But the sow turns back to sin even after receiving the truth. The dog turns against those who preach the truth to them, and they turn to tear them to pieces. But the pig trampled the holy pearls of God's wisdom underfoot on their way back to the mud. Hebrews 10, 26 through 29 speaks about trampling on the greatest pearl of all. And this is what it tells us. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remaining a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. Friends, the swine not only tramples on the pearls of God's wisdom, they trample the Son of God underfoot when they deliberately sin after receiving the knowledge of the truth. Jesus died in love to set them free, but they trample on him spiritually and count his blood as an ordinary thing so they can run back to the filth of their old sinful lifestyle. The fact is, people reveal their heart to God and who they are spiritually by how they receive the truth. You will know a pig by their returning to wallow in the mire of sin, and you will know a dog 
by their hostility towards God's truth and their preference to foolishness. If someone reveals these types of behavior to us, we must first, in love, rebuke them, and then we must stop giving them what is holy. And finally, we should pray for God to humble them so that they might come to repentance. Peter himself heeded the Lord's command in the case of Simon the sorcerer, which is recorded in Acts 8, 18 through 23. We read, when Simon the sorcerer saw through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given. He offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Peter actually saw that Simon was poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. He didn't guess or treat him any differently until he could see these facts plainly by Simon's actions and words. Once Peter saw who Simon really was by his fruit, he rejected him and rebuked him and explained that he had no part nor portion with them because Simon's heart was not right in the sight of God. Peter advised Simon to repent of his wickedness, but he didn't continue to give holy things to Simon any longer because he revealed that he was still bound by iniquity and in serious need of repentance. This is the pattern that Jesus would have us follow. We speak the truth to everyone in love. And when we find those who resist the truth, we recognize their spiritual condition, advise them to repent, and move on. Paul also gives us an example of following the Lord's command in Acts 13. It records, When the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first, but since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. Paul saw this particular group of Jews that he'd been preaching the word of God to had rejected God's truth. So he stopped giving them holy pearls and turned to the Gentiles in the area instead. And this is how we obey the Lord's words. We give everyone the truth, but their reaction determines whether or not we continue to invest in them. If they reveal that they are resisting the truth or not really repenting from their lifestyle of sin, we move on to preach to others who will truly receive the good news of our Lord. The last words we should share with all who resist the truth are words of warning. We see Jesus do just this in Matthew 11, 20 through 21, which says, Then Jesus began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. He said, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Because they wouldn't repent, Jesus gave them this very stern warning of the impending judgment and then moved on to other cities. And that is the pattern we should follow when someone reveals themselves to be of the spiritual swine or canine kind, end our conversation with them by calling them to repent. Jesus instructed his disciples to leave the town and dust off their feet when they witness someone rejecting God's truth. He said, whoever will not receive you nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake the dust off from your feet. 
Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Now, this is only to happen when they clearly reject the word of God and refuse to receive God's wisdom. So we must be very sure that we ourselves are clinging tightly to his word before we assume that they're wrongfully rejecting God. If we're not truly speaking God's words, then we are in the wrong, not them. Friends, Jesus is the only true source of wisdom and understanding, and his word is how we can learn the truth and share it with others. If we are following Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, we will be walking in the way of his word, transformed by the power of his truth and full of his amazing life. Then we can have something we definitely should be sharing. When it comes to sharing with a fool, Proverbs 23, 9 warns us, Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. We don't discern someone to be a fool by sight. We can only see a fool by how they respond to God's wisdom. If they despise the wisdom of God, then we know they're a fool and spiritually classified as a spiritual dog then we should stop sharing God's wisdom with them after one last warning and a dusting off, so to speak. Fools don't wear name tags and they don't look a certain way. You can't tell if someone's a fool by how much education they have. You can't tell if someone's a fool by how nice or junky their car or their house is. You can only spot a fool by their reaction to God's wisdom. Psalm 53, one explains, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have done abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. And Revelation 22:15 warns plainly, outside of God's kingdom are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral people and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. The fool loves and practices lies, and they prefer them over the truth. And the dogs and pigs prefer lies and sin over truth and righteousness every time. So they're living as fools. The gospel calls us to repent and turn away from our old life as we trust in Jesus to help us walk and cleanse us from our sin. And the Holy Spirit came to enable us to follow the Lord in truth. Agreeing with the truth and turning from lies is the beginning of how we are set free in Christ. In contrast, Paul explains that there will be those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. We must daily ask ourselves, am I loving God's truth or am I loving a lie? Am I living like a dog or a pig that rejects the truth of God's word or am I living like a sheep who is following the good shepherd? Once we answer that question and get the plank out of our own eye by following the Savior in sincerity, we can help others with their speck and find out if they're fellow sheep or a truth-rejecting dog or a sin-wallowing pig. In regards to this passage, we all fall into one of these three categories. Dogs reject Jesus' word and God and his wisdom. Pigs accept it but live in opposition to it. But sheep follow it by the strength and the wisdom of the shepherd. And Romans 8.1 reveals what happens to those who are not Christ's sheep. Saying the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. How does someone suppress or trample underfoot the truth? Simply by living in unrighteousness. Paul warns that those who are living like spiritual canines or spiritual swine are, will face the coming wrath of God. And we must warn them also in love as we learned last week. If they reject the truth, we must move on to find others who don't reject it and pray for those who did 
It's that simple. Now that we see how to respond to those who treat the truth of God's word like pigs or dogs, let's see how we should be responding to the Bible ourselves and how important our response is. In 1 Thessalonians 2.13, Paul wrote, For this reason, we thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. I once gave a sermon with verse after verse of what Jesus and Paul had to say about marriage and relationships and how we must conduct ourselves in them. And afterward, I heard one of the saddest things that's ever entered my ears. A young man who I'd been praying for and really trying to reach came up to me and said that the whole time I read and taught all of those scriptures straight from the Bible, he was thinking dating advice from Eric. This young man did not receive the word of God as it was in truth, the inspired word of our creator. He instead desired to keep on living in his sin and pretend that the words that I spoke were my own. I was devastated to hear his reaction. And it was not until I was preparing this week's sermon that I understood what was really going on. So I cannot emphasize this enough. He who has ears, let him hear. How we respond to the Bible is very, very important. We must accept all that Jesus said and did, not just the parts that we like. The word of God is not a buffet, and we cannot pick and choose which parts we want to keep and which parts we want to ignore. If you don't believe in all that Jesus taught, then you're not really following him as your shepherd. And you're not really believing in him as your savior. If you are truly believing in him and his word, then we have the promise it is working effectively in you to transform you into his likeness. Jesus said, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. But why do you call me Lord, Lord? and not do the things which I say. Jesus doesn't separate believing in him and obeying him. If you believe in him as Lord, then you will do the things that he taught and bear good fruit in the power of his Holy Spirit. When we receive the Lord's word in repentance and faith, the Spirit uses it to change us and make us like our Savior and we will bear fruit that matches up with the words of Christ. He taught us that a tree is known by its fruit, and we are to bear fruit worthy of repentance, meaning fruit that matches up with the truth of God's word. The New Testament is consistent. We will be known by our fruit that flows from our obedient relationship with Jesus that only can be entered by faith in him. James explains, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Brothers and sisters, God's word is how we were brought forth when we received it in faith. Jesus illustrates this principle in the parable of the soils. He explained that the seed is the word of God. Four soils receive the seed, 
but only one produced the fruit that the Lord is looking for because it received the word of God in a good and pure heart and held on to it with perseverance. Do we receive the word in faith and allow it to transform our hearts and minds? Are we holding on to God's word with perseverance and obedience? If so, we will bear good fruit as we abide in Jesus. That's why James 1, 21 through 22 tells us, Therefore, don't be a dog, don't be a pig. Instead, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, the seed, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. The word, like a seed, is implanted within us when we receive it in faith. And the word is able to save our souls through the blood of Jesus Christ shed at Calvary. James adds that we must be sure we are not self-deceived people who hear the word but refuse to do it. I would add that we must make sure we're not picking and choosing which parts we accept and which parts we reject. It is all the word of God, not just parts of it. So James is not referring just to parts of what Jesus said and did. He's referring to all of it. In Luke 11, Jesus said, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. In John 8, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. These foundational verses are lost and forgotten many times today. But they are the foundation of what our Savior plainly taught in the word that has been delivered to us. He justifies us through faith in his blood. He empowers us to obey him through his spirit. And he sanctifies and perfects us through his word. The word of God is very important to our eternal future. And how we receive it reveals what we are spiritually. Dogs are a metaphor associated with violent, foolish, or animalistic people in Scripture who foolishly reject God's truth. And dogs are hostile and despise the truth of God's word. Pigs are associated with people who are ungrateful and unclean and attracted to return to filthy, sinful behavior instead of being attracted to obeying the truth. So pigs inadvertently trample God's word underfoot as they run back to their beloved sins over and over. But sheep are those who recognize the word as the master's voice and follow him. Jesus explains, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. This is the spiritual sequence of events for God's sheep. They hear the word of God and recognize it as the voice of their shepherd. Then they repent and believe on him which allows them to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Then they follow him like any good sheep would follow its shepherd. And finally, the good shepherd will give his sheep, who persevere to the end, as he said, eternal life. This means that they will never perish. No one will ever separate them from the shepherd for all of eternity. And they will spend the ages dwelling with their Savior in peace, justice, righteousness in unapproachable light. God desires this for everyone, and so should we, because ultimately we want our heart to reflect his magnificent heart. Unfortunately, many reject his gracious offer of mercy. And when they do, we should move on to reach more people, always desiring to find fellow sheep 
who recognize the shepherd's voice.